Ok, potete partire. Good afternoon to everybody. It is a pleasure to have today Professor uh, Isidori from the University of Zurich, which will uh, uh, offer the first colloquium of uh, 2022. Okay, let me briefly introduce Professor Isidori. And Gino Isidori joined the physics department of the University of Zurich in 2014 as full professor in theoretical physics. Uh, he obtained his PhD from the University of Roma La Sapienza in 96. And then he got several uh, researcher positions in Slack, for instance, or at CERN. And then he became uh, director of research at the INFN in Frascati. Uh, then he was uh, uh, an invited professor at La Scuola Normale uh, of Pisa, and then a scientist associate at CERN from 2011 to 2013, before becoming full professor in Zurich. Uh, Gino Isidori is a leading scientist in particle physics, in particular, he has provided seminal and pioneering works in several directions, such as uh, works on uh, the vacuum stability of the universe, flavor physics, and effective field theories uh, relevant for uh, particle physics. Uh, indeed, the today colloquium is devoted to uh, a very important subject related to flavor physics, uh, which uh, stem from old problems to uh, recent hopes in flavor physics. And let me uh, conclude uh, just uh, uh, summarizing few uh, other uh, main responsibility charges of Gini Sidori. And let me just comment that uh, since last year is a member of the scientific, scientific policy committee of CERN, and in the 19, he was awarded by the ERC Advanced Grant. Okay, uh, so uh, please, Gino, feel free to start the presentation as you wish. But before, let me just remind people that uh, you are allowed to interrupt the speaker and ask questions anytime you wish. And uh, uh, in any case, there is also a Q&A section at the end of uh, the colloquium where we could uh, maybe answer more deeply and carefully to uh, the question which will arise uh, during this uh, presentation. So please, Gino. Thank you very much, Paide, uh, for two, two kind uh, introduction. Let me uh, start to uh, share this slide. Uh, yes. Can you see them? Uh, no, so I should put the full screen. Can you see the full screen? Yes, of course. Okay, uh, so it's really a pleasure to be here to participate in this colloquium if, uh, virtually. Um, and as Perry said, please interrupt any time uh, because I think I'm happy to, to have a feedback of what I'll try to, to discuss. So I, I today we'll discuss about uh, flavor physics. Uh, uh, discussing both all problems uh, and uh, the first part of my presentation, and then focusing on some interesting recent results, which are these lepton flavor violating anomalies, uh, which I think are very interesting. Hope that we are maybe starting to see something new in uh, in, uh, in particle physics. So, as you know, in particle physics we have a very nice, elegant, uh, simple theory which we call standard model which is remarkably successful, describe all what we observe in terms of very limited set of basic constituents, quarks and leptons, and the, the, the gauge boson that mediates the, the, the non-interaction is, is a beautiful theory, relatively simple and elegant. Actually, we call it model, I think for historical reasons, but it's really a theory like uh, general relativity. However, this theory, uh, despite being successful and, and somehow beautiful, uh, has some problems, has some unanswered question. For instance, uh, has a lot of problems related to, to cosmological observation that cannot describe dark matter, dark energy, inflation, but it also has some more structural problem really as a, as a quantum field theory, the hierarchy problem, the flavor problem, 
And so we, we think this is just an effective theory, that this is the low energy limit of something deeper that contains uh, more degrees of freedom, more elementary degrees of freedom. And so we just see the, the low energy projection of that, that is what we call the standard model. So the, the, the game in particular physics is to understand which is this uh, deeper construction. So we think there is something up there that we call the UV completion of the standard model, it's an ultraviolet completion of the standard model. And, uh, and, it, and what we have seen is just this uh, low energy part of, of the theory. Uh, what we know after the, the, the first phase of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is that uh, yeah, this structure is complete. So the, the missing piece was the Higgs boson that has been found in 2012. Actually, it's, it's relatively light. It's not even the, the heaviest particle of, of the theory, which is the, the top. And then there is a mass gap. This is the very important information. So the, the, the experiment at the Hadron Collider, those at the highest energy have not seen any other particle just nearby. So clearly there is a mass gap between these degrees of freedom and what is above. But as I said, we have deep reason to think that there is something uh, at higher energy. So if you want at smaller distances, uh, just to make a, a, a simple example for the non-expert, it's like that we have identified the, the long range structure of the theory, okay? So what was survived at low energies or if you want large distance, and we want to understand if there are smaller pieces. So if these big pieces are made of some smaller, maybe more elementary, more simple constituents. And this is a very difficult question to answer. I, actually, we, we know that it's difficult because in a sense, we, we already did it, this type of exercise to, to go up and, and understand the simpler constituent in the case of the standard model itself. Actually, previously there was the, the Fermi theory and so on. It took the 30, 40 years to, to build the standard model to understand this basic simple constituent rather than the further low energy layer, which is uh, uh, all the nuclear structure. And now we would like to somehow understand uh, what, what's above. It's very difficult because it's very difficult to, to go to high energy. So we cannot do that. And there is this mass gap. So it's, uh, it's difficult if you want expensive. Now, if we cannot go directly to high, high energies, and maybe we'll do it in the future, but for the moment we, we cannot do it. The best we can do to understand what's beyond the standard model, the ultraviolet completion, is to look at this effective theory and to understand if there are unnatural features, some, something that uh, you see you cannot explain in terms of the building blocks that you have. So if you, some, something, if you see something that you, even if it's macroscopic, but it's not made of the building blocks you have, you understand that, that you, you miss some piece. Okay, now trying to be more serious. So I have to really <clears throat> give a, a, a more technical definition of what is uh, an effective uh, field theory. Uh, so let's give a closer look to the standard model effective field theory. So it really is, we think that this is a projection to lower energies of, of a deeper theory. So applied to the standard model, this concept gives rise to this uh, Lagrangian, where we have the gauge sector. So actually this is the known gauge structure of the standard model, the one describing the, the known forces, strong, weak, and electromagnetic. Then there is the Higgs sector. So these are, if you want, are the interactions surviving at large distances. Large here means uh, really compared to the, to, to the short distance that we would like to probe. Technically, these are the operator of dimension up to four in, in, in quantum field theory. But in practice, what means is this is are the effects surviving the, at the all energy scale. So really the long range forces and the basic constituent. But then if there is something else, some heavier dynamics, uh, this would manifest at low energies as a series of contact interactions. So we cannot really resolve these heavy dynamics, but if this is there, we'll give rise to a series of contact interaction that we describe with a series of higher dimensional operators. This is actually really the remnant of the heavy dynamics. So we want, this is a, is a mathematical way to really parameterize in general terms, uh, this effective theory, okay? Now, when I was speaking that we would like to understand if there are unnatural feature of this construction. And now there are two independent aspects of this, this, this question. This unnatural feature should be some of the imprint, okay, of the ultraviolet down to low energy. There are two aspects. One is, okay, here in the leading part, the one that survived at large distances, we can think of the, we, 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 can, we can look if there are a natural aspect in the low energy coupling. So in the coupling here, in the, in the normalizable part of the theory, if they are very unnatural, very strangely uh, arranged, this 
it's certainly it's, it's an imprint of what 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 is above and this is a qualitative imprint because it really is is a is a general property that whatever it's 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 here will only change the value of this coupling but uh, we don't really know how it will change it on the other hand uh, uh, a more interesting quantitative imprint of the ultraviolet theory is really this effective operator here because they are not there if we don't have some extra degrees of freedom okay so this is really a, would be a clear evidence of something new now concerning this uh, unnatural aspect of the energy gap this is a, is a well-known thing uh, actually the most notable case is the famous electroweak hierarchy problem so what is the electroweak hierarchy problem when, when we look at the higgs mass the higgs mass uh, uh, is described by one parameter here in the lagrangian the, the, the higgs mass but it uh, it is uh, sensitive to the possible higher degrees of freedom in a, in a quadratic way so it's it's very strange to think that this is a light unless that is the value that we measure the 125 gv unless there is something relatively close by in energy that basically stabilizes this okay so this is the, the physical higgs mass come from a, a competition of the parameter in the lagrangian and this extra contribution so this is the argument why we think that there has to be some new physics there has to be there some new physics at most at around tera electron, tera electron volt energies, which is just a factor of one order of magnitude above what we see here, because otherwise we really have to, to, to cancel these this two terms to a, a high accuracy to, to, to explain the, the mass we see. You see, this is not really a strong argument, but it's, a, it's, it's a, an interesting suggestion. That there's something out there not too far from the energy scale that we have probed so far. Yeah, this is a well-known fact indeed actually almost all the beyond the standard model construction which have been proposed in the last uh, 30 years or so were really about this fact trying to understand how to stabilize the Higgs sector what i want to point out in this talk that there is another interesting aspect which is related to flavor okay actually flavor has interesting aspect in both this direction the unnatural value of the standard model couplings and evidence of a higher dimensional operator and uh, I think now it starts to be really a compelling set of, of indication that is, is telling us something about the ultraviolet completion. And uh, probably in the future, this will tell us even more. And, uh, and I think it's, um, for what it's a bit of a limitation to consider only the, the Higgs sector itself and not this information coming from flavor. So let's look at flavor more, more uh, closely. This was just to, to introduce the, really the, the main theme. So flavor is a, is, a, is a problem that has been with us since a, a long time, okay? really from the first discovery of another particle with the same property of the electron, which was the muon. Okay? Uh, this was happening in, in the 50. And after that, then we discovered all this structure with three families, which is really puzzling. So again, coming back to our effective Lagrangian, here we have the, the, the gauge sector, which describe strong, weak, and electromagnetic interaction. As I said, these are really the, the long range forces of, of the standard model. This structure is completely, is very symmetric, okay? It's completely determined by the number of the, the, the particle that we observe at low energies and their charges under these forces. And what is really amazing is that we have three identical replicas. So here we have the first family, up and down quark, electron, neutrinos, charm, strange quark, mu and neutrino, top and bottom quark, tau and neutrino, which from the point of view of the forces are identical. Really, there is no distinction between the, the electron and the muons or the muon and the tau from the point of view of the strong, weak, and the electronic interaction. The same is true for up charm, for charm top, uh, strange and down and so on. The only thing that distinguishes this particle is not the gauge sector, so not the standard long range forces, but the interaction with the Higgs. The Higgs, Okay, is what uh, is a kind of a background field in the theory interact, interacting through which the particle acquire a mass. Because actually, if we were only because of the gauge interaction, they would be all massless. On the other hand, they interact with the Higgs to get the mass. And so the famous Yukawa interaction is the interaction between fermions and the Higgs that given the Higgs as a non-trivial vacuum expectation value is the way we describe fermion masses, okay, quark and lepton masses. These masses are now are generic, okay, are, are, well, 
we, we would, could have expected they are genetic numbers because we don't know what these coupling are. And what we observe is that on the other hand, they are very hierarchical. So the, the first family has very small masses. You see in this table here, you see the, the, the different, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a spectrum in a logarithmic scale. So we have very light masses for the first generation, heavier masses for the second generation, heavy and even more heavy mass for the, for the uh, third generation. Actually between here and here, there are five order of magnitude of separation. So it's really a very hierarchical structure. Also the mixing, these are three by three matrices in what we call flavor space. So flavor is really this dimension of, of generation, okay, that are, which is a, is a compact structure with only three uh, layers, but it's, a, it's complicated enough because it, everything are, are, are three by three matrices. And for instance, I show you what we deduce about this coupling here in, in the case of, of the up quark is a very hierarchical structure. I indicate with the color, if you want the different strength, there is one coupling which is uh, as a strength uh, one, which is the top quark you have a coupling. And then we have other coupling which are much smaller. So the, the coupling here, BTS, which control the, the mixing of the top to the second generation is, is a 0.04. It's already much smaller than this one. The, the, the charm you have a coupling is, uh, is 5.5% and, and smaller and smaller value here, which I don't even, not even put. So clearly it's a, it's a very hierarchical structure this one means how the particle interact with the Higgs and therefore the masses that we observe at uh, low energies, which doesn't appear to be accidental. This is why we, we call it a, a problem. It's not really a technical problem, but it's a, it's a puzzle, okay? It's a, we don't understand why it is like this and we would like to have a deeper explanation of this because it doesn't look uh, at all accidental. So summarizing what we, observe in the standard model is a very symmetric structure from the point of view of, of flavor. It is a large flavor symmetry. So the gauge interaction, the known forces for them, the three families are identical. Actually, this technically is a big symmetry, U3 to the fifth power, because we have five different fields with the, with the, which appear in three copies. And then we have a very peculiar breaking coming from only with the interaction with the Higgs, which are these Yukawa coupling. They, they break these uh, degeneracy, this flavor symmetry, but in a very peculiar way, in a very specific direction, because it's, it's a left-right coupling and with a very hierarchical structure. So this, I call it the peculiar breaking. So the, the merging of these two observations give rise to a series of uh, approximate or even sometimes exact uh, accidental symmetries. The, the, one of them, for instance, is, is lepton flavor. So the fact that uh, all the interaction conserve exactly the flavor of the lepton. So the lepton electron number, mu number, tau number is always conserved in the standard model. And we don't impose this. It comes accidentally just because we break the flavor symmetry only via this type of interaction. This type of interaction is not able to violate the uh, flavor. This is an exact symmetry, but there are a, a lot of other approximate ones. For instance, isospin, is just an approximate symmetry because the masses of up and down, which are non zero, but they are, they are also even not uh, equal, but they are all very small. So we can neglect them in first approximation. And this is what gives rise to approximate symmetry. So again, the, the Yukawa coupling here responsible for up and down masses are very small. So this gives rise to an approximate symmetry. And there are several of those, okay? Which, because of this peculiar breaking structure. I think it's worth to, uh, investigate a bit more about this concept of, of uh, uh, approximate symmetry. I will come to, to, to that in a moment. But before, before discussing that, let me say that in principle, if there are these extra degrees of freedom, we should expect many other sources of, of uh, breaking of the flavor degeneracy. For instance, I can build an operator of this type, uh, which couple uh, two fermions with other two fermions, an interaction of this type, and these could contribute to meson anti meson mixing and would spoil completely what we observe. So we are able to put a very strong bounds on the interaction of this type, which, which you see here illustrated in this uh, diagram. Bounds which go to very high energies, I mean, up, even up to 10 to the five or more uh, tera electron volt, which means that this extra interaction, if they are there, they really don't break flavor in a, in a generic way, okay? As one could have expected, again, if there is something uh, if flavor is not a special property. On the other hand, 
similar to the Yukawa coupling. Also here, we seem to have to see some very peculiar structure with, the, with either with really no new physics out there up to very high energies or with a very peculiar type of, of breaking. So as I was saying, I mean, I, I want to uh, discuss a bit more this role of the flavor symmetry. Um, are they really accidental, fundamental, what, what, what they are? So the concept of accidental symmetry is a very important concept, a concept in, in quantum field theory. So the accidental symmetries are symmetries which are not fundamental properties of the theory, but emerge accidentally at all energies simply because we, we, we don't have enough freedom to discuss, uh, to, to, to describe the, the, the violation of the symmetry. So here in, in the long range part of interaction, simply we don't have enough variables to describe the violation of the symmetry. It's like in a multiple expansion, we're just seeing the, 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 the leading multiple. But the idea is that this symmetry is not really a fundamental probability of, of the ultraviolet theory. So if this is the case, then, I mean, at some scale, we should really have a violation of the symmetry, which then will manifest via the contact interaction also at all energies uh, as, a, as a breaking of or, or violation of the symmetry. So this is a, is a very powerful way to possibly reveal the presence of mu degrees of freedom. It's very powerful because uh, you see also experimentally, it's easy to see a violation of a symmetry, even if this is very tiny. And here the effect is tiny because it's suppressed by the masses of the, of the, the scale of the, this uh, extra interaction. But uh, um, <clears throat> we can see it because uh, it describes a phenomenon which is not present in the, in the leading part of it. So there are well-known examples in the past that this has been very successful as a way to describe, to describe uh, uh, physics beyond the, the, the scale probed directly in the experiment. Just to make an example, I mean, probably the, the most famous example is, is are the weak interaction. You see, in the, in the, the, the Fermi theory was discovered, I mean, what, because if you just take strong interaction and, and QED, you have an exact flavor symmetry. So these two interactions cannot describe any violation of, of symmetry. Indeed, the, the, the weak interaction, if it was much weaker, was seen because it was the only interaction allowing a change of flavor up to down quarks is, is, the, is, the, is the weak interaction, the beta decays. And indeed, by the weak interaction was what possible to identify the scale, I mean, which at that time okay, was, was the, 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 the Fermi scale. Another maybe less trivial example is the, the case of the standard model with two generations. If we take the standard model with two generations, we have as accidental symmetry CP because we can remove all the, the phases and therefore uh, we cannot describe CP violation. So in the, in the, in the 70s, when the standard model was, was uh, started to be built, uh, actually, there was, uh, when, when the JF side was discovered, it was a, a case where we have a standard model with two generations, and there was a puzzle in mean, how to describe a CP relation. This could be described with an effective operator, which is called super weak interaction. And uh, actually, nowadays, we know that this was the manifestation of the top quark, but at that time, it was, was not uh, at all obvious. Indeed, one could associate this effective interaction to a, an SD operator, which again, we now know is mediated by the top. And the scale looked to be a very heavy scale. This is why it was called a super uh, uh, weak interaction. And again, this was a bit of an accident. And it is telling us that actually when we identify this effective scale, we should not take it too seriously because, I mean, not too literally as, as the scale where the new dynamics appear because the things can be more complicated. For instance, this effective scale of the super weak interaction was 10 to the 40 V. There is nothing at 10 to the 40 V. Actually, there is the top mass much below, but then because of a small mixing, these effectively correspond to this scale for this effective operator. Okay, so closing the parentheses, well, I'm stressing all this because now the violation of lateral flow universality, which are reported by experiment nowadays, which we'll now discuss in more detail, really belong to this uh, type of effect. So they are a violation of an accidental symmetry of our standard model. Another very important effect in general terms about uh, uh, um, accidental symmetry is that they allow to have stable scale separation. And to, to explain this concept, let me make another example, which probably is well known, which is the case of, of neutrino masses. Now, as we know, in the standard model, we cannot describe uh, uh, non-vanishing neutrino masses. To do that, we have to do it via an effective operator, a dimension five operator. 
And we know that neutrino masses are very small, but we don't have a problem with that because we attribute this to the fact that the, because this operator violate an accidental symmetry of this Lagrangian here, which is total lepton number. And therefore we can think that uh, this scale, it's, a, it's a, the scale where this symmetry is violated is very heavy. That's why neutrino masses are very small. And so this is why this operator is very suppressed, but this doesn't prevent to have a other intermediate scale where, for instance, we stabilize the Higgs sector. So this concept is very important because it's telling us that uh, <clears throat> seeing violation of a symmetry, first of all, we can probe scale, which are really very high. And also that we can have a multi-layer structure, okay? If, uh, if uh, a, 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 some new physics is associated to, to a breaking of a symmetry can appear at scale much higher than other type of, of uh, new physics. And you see this, I think we, we all accept this, accept this concept, uh, concept in the case of lepton number, which is an exact symmetry, but the same can be true also for flavor physics. So we can really have different layer where we break the flavor symmetry in different terms. So again, summarize this, this uh, general consideration. What we see that in the sun model, the, and as seen as effective theory, we have a, a large flavor degeneracy from the gauge sector, a specific uh, breaking from the Higgs sector, and stringent bounds on these uh, generic uh, uh, effective operators. And, and the big question what we like to understand is really how these flavor symmetries, these approximate flavor symmetry that we observe here are broken at uh, high energies, which is the, the possible different layer structure hidden beside what we observe, okay? And of course, this problem has been with us since a long time and there are different hypotheses have been formulated. So let me emphasize here two of the most popular one. So the first, I mean, the, the, the paradigm that in a sense was used for a long time in flavor physics also to explain why we don't see big effect here is so-called the so-called minimal evolution hypothesis, which is the following basic idea. The idea is that, okay, we have the electroweak symmetry, we have the electroweak scale, the Higgs scale, but the scale where flavor physics is generated is a much higher scale. So really this uh, approximate U3 to the five symmetry this assumption is that this holds up to very high energy scale and is broken, maybe close to the plant scale or whatever, at much higher scale, not accessible in experiment. So this idea was a, a good attempt, again, to explain why we don't see anything here, because we basically say that the only break on flavor symmetry are the Yukawa coupling that we generate at some very heavy scale. And it was the way to achieve the smallest possible new physics scale to stabilize the Higgs sector. So that was the, the rational. Postpone the breaking of the flavor symmetry as much as possible. This is technically doable because it, it's, it, it's a breaking of a symmetry which can, can happen at very uh, high energies, such that we can lower the effective scale of the flavor blind new physics as much as possible. But now we have not seen anything around the corner. So, this lowering of the uh, scale of new physics is, is not very much effective because actually now we have direct searches which are telling us that actually really there is nothing around the electroweak scale. We have to push the scale of new physics a bit higher. And actually, this lowering of the new physics scale under the deposit of minimum evaluation is really inefficient because uh, new physics under this hypothesis is coupled universally to all the families. And if it's coupled universally, actually we have to push the new physics scale even higher because uh, uh, because new physics then would couple universally to also to, to up and down quarks that we probe at LSE as valence quarks. And therefore this is in, in, in this setup, we really have to push the, 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 the scale of new physics quite high. And we, this gap starts to be disturbing. And also we don't explain, don't explain the, the hierarchy of the UCA coupling. So you see that this scenario, which I think, okay, was motivated, but uh, in, in certain, model for instance supersymmetry nowadays appear less much less uh, interesting because on one hand doesn't allow to to lower as much as possible this new physics scale and also because it doesn't explain the structure of the yukawa coupling so an alternative option which, which i will explore more in the in the rest of the talk is the idea that really there is a structural difference uh, in the different generation already uh, uh, around the corner that is uh, and this uh, Really, the, the, the 
the accidental symmetry at work, the, the one that we see that protect uh, flavor mixing uh, beyond the standard model, act only on the light generation. So the first two and not on the third one. And this is something that which is very well motivated by the structure that we observe in the Yukawa coupling. So the Yukawa coupling have the following structure as, as I uh, outline. So there is a big entry for the third generation and then smaller, smaller entries for the light masses and the mixing of, of the light mass, the light generation with the third one. So it's conceivable to think that really the third generation is a bit special, okay, and interact with new physics at relatively low energies. And then really the different layers, the, there are different layers and the, 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 the light generation enter into the game interacting with the new physics at higher scale. And this is why they appear here with smaller coupling. So actually this approach, uh, it's nicer because it allows to have new physics uh, close to the letter V scale, but only coupled to the third generation. And then new physics coupled to the first generation, which is much more dangerous because it would uh, destroy what we see in experiment uh, entering at much higher scale. And this is good because actually to stabilize the Higgs sector, we really need to, to couple new physics to the third generation. So I think it's really a, a, a good starting point. Also, it's a good starting point to understand what we see in the spectrum of the theory, which is really a difference between third generation and the other one. So this, I think, of course, this is something that has been, has been proposed already quite uh, some time ago, and was, again, was considered a kind of alternative option. The, if you want, the, the, the puzzling thing is that we really, okay, we have to give up this idea that we have uh, three identical generation, which on the other hand is what we seem to observe from the point of view of strong, weak, and electromagnetic interaction, okay? But maybe that's it. it's it's how nature is built, and uh, <clears throat> is it a challenge or an opportunity? I think the data seems to tell us that this is really maybe the way nature is it's uh, spilled. At least if we take seriously these these anomalies, which are starting to emerge from uh, from the physics experiment. Okay, so this conclude this first general introduction. Uh, I realized now discussing it that was a bit uh, also taken only for people who are not expert in quantum theory maybe maybe they got lost so if you have questions please uh, uh, let me know otherwise now i move to to discuss these the anomalies okay so let's look at the uh, at the anomalies so since 2013 uh, <clears throat> in simultaneous bdks uh, we started to observe some deviation from the anomaly prediction so some some what you call lepton flavor universality violation. That is a different behavior beside pure kinematic effect of the different lepton species in two types of process, B2S LL or B2 char lepton neutrinos. So B2S LL is, is a decay of a B quark into an S quark and the pair of leptons. Here we, we, we see a, a different behavior of new versus electron. And here is a, is a charged current transition. So B quark going to char quark plus a lepton neutrino pair. And here we see a difference between the tau and the light leptons. So what is lepton flavor universality? Lepton flavor universality is one of these accidental symmetries, is an approximate accidental symmetry that hold in the standard model in the limit when we neglect the Yukawa coupling. So in the, in the, in the Yukawa sector, the, the, if you just look at the Yukawa coupling, the leptons are very different, okay, because they have very different masses. And indeed they have very different Yukawa coupling. But all of them, you see, even the tau you have a coupling, the biggest one is 10 to minus two, which is much smaller than the gauge coupling, any gauge coupling. So the, 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 the you have a coupling are all small compared to the gauge coupling. And therefore it's a very good approximation to neglect them. We always neglect them except for the particle mass, the, 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 if you want the, the kinematical effect. So I think it's a very good approximation in the standard model to neglect the, the Yukawa coupling, and this was give rise to these uh, approximate lepton flavor universality. So to say that the dynamics of the different flavor is identical. But you see that actually the only interaction in about that can see the lepton differently, that is the Yukawa, see them very differently, but it's a very weak interaction. So it could well be that beyond the standard model, maybe there are new interactions that see the leptons differently and which have a slightly stronger strength. So uh, let's look at the data uh, in a qualitative way. So the, the way to, to really test this uh, 
symmetry is to look, for instance, at a ratio of these types, so a ratio of, of a hadron with a, with a big quark, the key into a hadron with the S quark and the muon pair, divided by the, the, the same process, exactly the same with the same type of hadron, but with the electron pair. So these are the standard predictions. In this ratio, you cancel all the difficult part of, of describing this process, which are the, the hadronic matrix element, and you predict one, but in this case, slightly less than one because of kinematical effect. And this is what one measure, actually, this was the situation in 2017, where, okay, yeah, there was some tension, but not very significant. Now the situation is, has improved, but actually one measurement has become three sigma deviating from the center order. Actually, now the <coughs> central value moves a little bit, but the error is very small. All of these ratios are below one. And once you put them together, really the, the significance is uh, it's high. And this is only one part of, of the puzzle. There is another case where we can see a suppression of, of muons, uh, which is uh, the branching ratio here, unnormalized of the B sub S into two muons. In this case, we are really able to make an absolute prediction in the standard model quite precise, which is this one here. And we see a suppression, which taken alone is not a big deviation, but goes exactly in the same direction. And finally, last but not least, there are other observable, which are more complicated because here one really has to enter into the hadronic part of the decay to make precise prediction. So the prediction is less reliable, but to the best of our knowledge, also here we see a deviation and which is again, also consistent with the unique BS mu mu local interaction. So this really seems to be the hint of a new effective operator. So when we try to put the things together, actually the, the two operators describe very well the data. We have to modify the, the <coughs> coupling of operator of this type, which Actually, in the standard model, these operators are not there, are generated only if you integrate out the, the W and the, and the Z, the heavy quarks, uh, the, the heavy field. Then we have to assume that there is a, a shift, okay, of, of this operator between mu and electron that is not possible in the standard model. So if we try to fit uh, uh, the data with this uh, parameter, let us a free parameter, that is what you get. You get very nice consistency of all the data and uh, you get uh, now putting all the data together, and these are only the clean observable, those which are insensitive to, 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 to hadronic uncertainty, you get a five sigma significance of the new physics hypothesis versus the standard model. The new physics hypothesis really is a specific one, which is a left-handed interaction, okay? a pure left-handed interaction. The significance is five sigma versus the standard model. Now, if I even try to put together the other observable, which are sensitive to charmer scattering, so it's a bit technical, then the significance is even higher than phi sigma, okay? And actually in this case, I need two parameters to really describe uh, the effect. Actually, this band here is the one from the clean observable. This other one is the one from all observable. You see here the standard model point, well, sorry, the standard model should, should be here, but okay, it's, it's very far from, from what we uh, measure. If you want to be super conservative, is well, we really don't know which is the nature of new physics. So if you want to try all the possible global, if we want to estimate the global significance, that is you evaluate all the possible new physics hypotheses, you go down to 4.3 sigma, which is still a extremely high significance. The other type of anomalies, uh, here I'm more brief because there are less data, is the b 2 sharp tau neutrino uh, uh, anomaly. Again, here also, this is measured via a ratio where we cancel hadronic uncertainty. Standard prediction is clean. Consistent result of, of three experiments which differ by three sigma. So this is the standard model, and this is the average of, of the result. Also, they are consistent with the with the left-handed amplitude, which is predict this type of correlation. And it's a much larger new physics effect because here the standard model is much larger, being three-level dominated. Okay, these are the data in a, in a nutshell. So let's now do some consideration of what can be really the, the explanation be, behind this data. <clears throat> so. These anomalies are seen only in quark lepton operators. So same leptonic operator with quark and lepton. We definitely need the left-handed uh, <coughs> operators, the left-handed uh, quarks and leptons. And what we seem to see is a big effect competing with the standard model level in B2 charm, tau nu, a much smaller effect, but actually cleaner from the experimental point of view in B2S mu mu. You see here, I list the generation, and you see that here, here, in this case, we have more second generation field. Here, in this case, we have more third generation field. So the idea is that we have something 
maybe big for the third generation and smaller and smaller terms, the, the more we put second generation field, which seems to point to a, a, a connection to what we see in the Yukawa Kappa. So it's very nice. It seems to highlight a, a connection between these anomalies and the Yukawa Kappa. So, uh, sorry, I think there is a, there is a telephone in my, in my, in my uh, office. Um, <clears throat> So data point to a, an effective operator of this type between SMU with, uh, with uh, whose whose strength is 10 to the minus five the, the, the Fermi scale. You see, it's a it's a very, very small interaction. And uh, um, this is what we determine from the, 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 the precise observable. Then it's a if we, if we Try to describe also this effect of the other BSL mu observable. We can still describe it by the same type of operator. Okay, is a is a quark lepton lepton quark operator with a different flavor. In this case, actually, what the way to describe this with the same type of operator is, is via a, a, a operator collecting BDS and tau tau, closing the tau loops, and finally generating now a universal correction to electron muons, and. The, <clears throat> Actually, if, if I switch on this def, these two effects of BS mu and BS to tau tau, I can really describe perfectly all the data. And what is very nice is that this type of operator, now you see this is an operator with, with the left-handed field, so I have a connection between charged current and neutral current. This operator also can give a contribution to the, the, the charged current anomalies. Actually, the size of this operator was predicted before it was observed from the, the, the charged current. Okay, so I think it's a very nice consistency of the two type of, of anomalies. And the, the, the coupling here has to be much bigger because actually it contributes here only at the loop level. So get the suppression because of, of the loop effect. So as you see here from, from the scale of this operator, so the, the two, three mu mu operator, I call I call the coupling of this operator with a label that determine the, the, the quark second, third generation in the down basis and the lepton here. So here the scale is essentially 10 to minus 5 in units of the Fermi scale, while this other operator to 3 tau tau is uh, 10 to minus uh, 3. Okay, so there is a two order of magnitude difference between these two. Now let's look at what happens to the to the charged current. Again, I can describe it with the same type of operator here. But now if I use as a reference basis the, the one of the down quark, I, I will have to use the rotation between up and down quark, which in the standard model is controlled by the CK matrix. So is, I have a weighted combination of 3, 3 tau tau and 2, 3 tau tau with different CKM elements. And so I have a, if you want the, the, my observable, which is the B2 sharp tau define a area in this plane where I have the two coefficient here. And here, the relevant region, because I, I, I cannot have a too big a 3, 3 tau tau because of, of bounds from high energy observable, is the region where these two are separated by, again, a factor of 10 to minus 1. And finally, here I can put the, the previous information that I get from the charge current, from the neutral current, because this 2, 3 tau tau appears also in the neutral current via this loop effect. And you see there is a very nice consistency. So it's like this idea that there is something big for third generation, the 3, 3 tau tau is the biggest effect. The scale is 10 to minus 2 compared to the Fermi scale. Then I go to 10 to minus 3 for the 2, 3 tau tau and a, a, a further suppression when I go to, to the new one. So just to give you a, 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 again, a, a, a summary of this, maybe not, not to get lost in, in all this data. So which is the idea is that we have something big for BB to tau tau. Okay. And the, 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 the biggest anomalies from the point of view of the data is this B to S mu, but this is small effect, but it's the one on which we have the, the higher significance. And so we have this BS mu, whose strength is 10 to minus three times a, 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 a scale. And the, the idea is that there is a natural connection to a, a stronger interaction here, which involves on the other hand, only third generation. This one, again, we see it here in BS mu, this one, when we do the CKM rotation, contribute to, to B2 charm uh, lepton neutrino. And then, of course, the, the idea is that each time I put a second generation field, I pay a suppression factor. So there should be the intermediate step. So here I have BB tau tau, here BS tau tau, BS tau mu, and BS mu mu, 
some of these effects have not been seen yet. For instance, we don't see BS tau mu, but simply because this is difficult to, to observe. This one, BS tau tau, the, on the other hand, we see it, although with, with less significance, uh, because it, it gives this extra effect in BS LL, with, uh, with, whose significance is, uh, is uh, quicker, but still consistent. Actually, and these two together contribute to, to V2 charm and U. I mean, really, the two together give a good description of the person data. And finally, you see that clearly here, we should, if this is there, since the, the, the effective scale is, is a few TV, we should really hopefully see it uh, uh, at, uh, at, at the LSE in, in, in PP2 tau tau. And the hope is that this may be connected to the stabilization of the Higgs sector. This is still a hope, but it's, it's possible because the, the scale is, is, is consistent with that. And, okay, so this is the, the, the pattern emerging from data is that we can put all the things together. We have consistent with all the data uh, with this simple structure of operator. I should also tell you what we do not see, okay? So for instance, if I rearrange here, and, and take an operator with four quarks with the same scaling and same overall scale, I have a problem because I don't see four quark operator. We don't see four lepton operator or semi-leptonic operator with a different structure. And this calls for, for a specific type of, of a UV completion. That is, we only generate this operator at least in first place. And this can be done with the lepton quark uh, models. Indeed, not by, by chance here, I have a leptocore current, QL current, not a, a QQLL structure. So in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, let me <coughs> go read to more. For, for a moment, I just described the data using an effective theory. And now I really want to make some model building consideration of what, what we have seen. Again, starting from the, 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 the flavor structure. So if, if we, when we identify an EFT construction, if you really want to go deeper understand the, the, the ultraviolet completion, we have to understand the flavor structure and the nature of the mediator. Now, concerning the flavor structure, again, to understand what we see, let me go back to, to what I told you was the old party, uh, paradigm, which was minimum flavor relation. That was the idea that, the old idea that maybe flavor physics is, uh, new physics is flavor blind. So it doesn't see flavor up to very high energies. This paradigm was indeed the idea of concentrating on the stabilization of the Higgs sector, which should appear close to the electroweak scale, and then kind of nothing else. So it was the idea that the, the, the three generation are kind of identical copies up to very high energies. Now, what these data are telling us, as I try to illustrate, that this is not the right way to address the problem. Maybe really there is a deep uh, layer structure, a more sophisticated multi-layer structure with different generation speaking to new physics at different energy scale. So the third generation speak with new physics, these new degrees of freedom close to the electroweak scale. And that's why it gets the big mass. So the Yukawa coupling of the third generation is generated there, and therefore it is not very suppressed, while the Yukawa coupling of the other generation are generated at higher scale, and this is why they are suppressed. So the idea is that really there are flavor non-universal interaction already here the third generation behave very differently from the first two. So we cannot treat the generation as identical copies up to area scale. This fact that they appear as identical copy control energies, maybe it's just an accident. It's an accident because they have the same charges under the long range forces, but it could well be that they are structurally different when we go to high energies. And so what we are exploring now in data is just this first part here where one should expect is a theory where new physics is coupled mainly to third generation and the first approximation we can treat the first the light families as uh, the, the first two families as massless and decoupled from new physics except for small mixing effect and this really is connected to what we observe in the yukawa cup concerning mediators we, which can be the the, the good mediator I already anticipated, I think clearly the best candidates are leptocore because just because of the simple fact that we observe anomalies in semi electronic operators, which are generated by the leptocore at the three level, and we don't observe the deviation in process like a four quark, which would be generated by the leptocore at the one loop level. If I would have taken a, a for instance, a W prime or a Z prime, 
this could also generate a three level semi leptonic, but then a three level generates also for quark or for lepton operator that we don't see. So that's why it's a, it's a good starting point. And also for the direct searches, lepton quark hides much better and explain why we have not seen them yet. Indeed, there's been a, a, a renaissance of lepton quark model recently in the, in the literature in the last uh, five, six years because of this fact. But also, then people realize that, okay, also from the model building point of view, independently of the anomalies, there are a lot of interesting properties of the leptoquark. Once you start to understand that they can have, they can have a non-trivial flavor structure. Uh, now, going brief, I mean, which, which type of leptoquark we need? Actually, there are several types of possible leptoquark fields depending on, on the charge assignment. The one that works best for both anomalies is this U1 leptoquark, which is a, 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 a field which is a, is a color of triplet, it's coupled to quark, but then it's a singlet of SU2, so it doesn't carry SU2 and as a, the charge of, of a down quark. And so it really contributes at three level, both for B to mu coupling, but also to, to uh, or B to tau, but also for char neutrino. Okay, so it can contribute to the both type of anomalies at the three levels. And even more interesting is the, is the massive gauge boson that one expects in the SU4 group of Patisalam, which unify quark and lepton. And I'll come back to this uh, now in a very few minutes, but let me first discuss the phenomenological concept. So now if I consider only these uh, uh, lepton quark here, and I try to describe is general coupling to quark and lepton, Assuming this multi-layer structure, therefore the, the, the coupling is smaller and smaller for the light generation, like what we observe in the Yukawa coupling. Then have this parameter, I, I, we, we fit them, and there are not many, there are essentially only four parameters to, to fit to the data. And of course, we can describe very well the anomalies, not a surprise. What is, if you want a sur surprise, that uh, we do not hit bounds from high energy observable. And actually that we predict something for our high energy observable, which is really around the corner. Okay, it's so actually, this is these uh, laptop course, you, you determine, you fix this coupling B to, to tau from the anomalies. And then you predict this region here. Okay, this is mass versus leading coupling. The, the, this GU is, is the coupling for the third generation here. You predict uh, uh, that, uh, for instance, in a process like PP to tau tau, which is uh, whose Feynman diagram are, are shown here, you should see a deviation from the summary prediction, which is really, uh, you see in, in gray, are, are the pleasant uh, exclusion bound. So this region is really close to the present bound, but it's not excluded yet. So this information here, do not take into account the direct searches, is the prediction of the effect in direct search that one deduced from the low energy data. And also one, okay, this is actually in the case without retentive current, this is the case with retentive current, so there are still some model uncertainty. And also one predict uh, <coughs> effect in uh, other rare process like uh, tau to mu phi, so lepton flavor violation or BS to tau mu or, or B to K tau tau. These are all effects that can be seen in the near future with, uh, with um, the present, uh, with, with the future experiment like uh, Bell 2 and, and uh, the, the, the future program of, of LSEB actually with a wide area of parameter space will be covered <coughs> by these experiments. So I think it's, it's a very interesting prospect. And finally, really, uh, uh, I hope in, in five minutes, I can give you a glimpse of why I think this laptop work is really interesting from a model building point of view. Uh, the, the, the first observation, goes back to this idea of Pati Salam of a unification of quark and leptons. So the, 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 this is a very old idea in the 70s to unify quark and lepton via the gauge group SU4. So the idea of Pati Salam was lepton number as the four color. So we, the idea is that fermions appear in four plates where we have the three quark and the lepton. So the three color and lepton number is, is the four color. So this gauge group SU4 contains inside SU3 color. And when we, we, we can break it to SU3 times B minus L. So here is a schematic view of the generator of SU4, which are color, B minus L, and exactly this left of quark we need to expand the anomaly, nothing else. So it's really minimal, beautiful. 
but the Patti Salam model doesn't work because Patti Salam had no uh, flavor structure. Okay, so then this left of work, if would if would would see the the generation in the same way, would be a problem because, for instance, then this left of work would couple also to to S and muons or D and electrons, so you you would rule it out from say K long to mu e. So we have to put a non-trivial flavor structure, this possible multi-layer structure into the game. We can do that uh, sticking to Pati Salam and playing with, with mixing, but it's not so elegant, I would say, and would not really does not really solve the problem. The best way, in many opinions, is really to take this indication that a special role for the third generation and, and the structural structure, structural difference between the generation. So the Pati Salam group is this one, SU4 times SU2 times SU2. And we we decompose this, actually we, we promote this as a as a SU4 times SU3, where color is the diagonal subgroup. And <clears throat> you see, the idea is that now we have, instead of having SU4, we have SU4 times SU3 with the diagonal subgroup, which is color. But now these two group act on the different generation in a universal way. So it's a flavor dependent separation. You see, this is very similar to what we had in the case of the electroweak interaction, where we have SU2 left and hypercharge, which act in a different way on the chirality, okay, left and right field. Here, the separation would be on the flavor. And uh, here, we have a diagonal subgroup, which is uh, uh, electromagnetism. Here, the diagonal subgroup is color. These are really the two true long range forces, uh, <clears throat> those which are not breaking at, at any scale except okay, the dynamical breaking of, of, uh, of QCD. And, and really, this, this uh, breaking, so well, well, this breaking here happens at the electric scale, this breaking here should happen at, at the FUTV scale. And this would be the first step, I mean, really, of distinguishing the third generation from the other two. Then eventually, the other two, we can distinguish the first and second one at, at even higher scale. Okay. Indeed, there are a lot of options which have been proposed in the literature to, to, to further complete this. I will not enter into the game, but really the, 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 the key structure is this one. So it's, as you, so it's like uh, <clears throat> having a more uh, deeper structure behind color. So color really emerged as a subgroup of a richer structure that see flavor in a different way. And uh, actually, uh, uh, just as I mentioned, I mean, a, 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 a class of model we are working on, which I think are very interesting, are model based on extra dimension, where we really uh, could really allow to make a full theory of flavor. We could really compute the yoga coupling. And these uh, multi layer structures, these multi scale structures, correspond to a different, uh, <coughs> different brains on, on an extra dimensional construction. Okay, this is just to give you a glimpse that I think is really very nicely motivated class of model. but. Now, from the point of view of phenomenology, sorry, really what matters is this structure here, SU4, SU3, SU2, U1, where again, color is the subgroup here, which has to be broken to the standard model. When you break it, the point that we have the, in SU4, you have the nice laptop quark, but then clearly you have more generator here, so you have, a, you have to break also the residual SU3, so you get in addition a Z prime and the coloron, that is a, is a heavy octet <coughs> couple in a non-universal way to light and third generation. The construction is a bit more complicated because you have to describe all the, all the formulas, but it's, it's highly constrained because you can really compute the, 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 the Yukawa coupling. And so a, a lot of parameters are fixed to what you observe at energies. And in this setup, really everything is calculable. It's a normalizable theory that reproduce all the features of the EFT. You can compute also process like Delta F equal to that you were not able to compute in the pure EFT approach. You can make for the precise prediction for IPT data, and you predict something more. For instance, I mean, just to make an example, I mean, the new striking signature is this coloron, which is a kind of heavy octet coupled mainly to third generation, which, for instance, you should be able to see in proton proton to, to top top, uh, so top top collision, top top production in proton proton collision. So I think it's a very interesting, exciting thing. All this related to this non trivial flavor structure, which seems to to highlight also non-universal non gauge interaction. Okay, so I think it's, it's time to conclude. I, I, I hope I give you a message that flavor is, is an essential ingredient to understand the structure of the SMEF, I mean, so the standard model seen as an effective field theory. Actually, this statement 
was true, I mean, is there, even independent of the anomalies, we just see it from the Yukawa coupling. Okay, we tend to ignore it, I think, for, for a long time, simply because we don't have really good models, but I think it's, it's there. And the recent anomalies really reinforce this fact. The statistical significance of the anomaly is really growing. I mean, the B2SL system, the chance that this is a pure statistical fluctuation, it's, it's marginal, I would say. B2 charm is still, is still an open issue, but B2SL is really significant, it's high. And when you combine the two set of anomalies, then really the indication toward new physics, it's, it's quite clear. I mean, of some new physics, which, uh, which has a non-trivial flavor structure, appear around the TV scale and involve mainly the third family. And possibly therefore is connected to the, to the origin of flavor. I think right now there is no contradiction with, with all the other precision tests which have been made of the standard model, but other non-standard effects should emerge soon. You see, we, 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 we live dangerously, especially as far as the IPT data. So I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting scenario to, to, to be tested with more high energy data and also with more precision observable in the low energy sector. Okay, thank you very much. And sorry if I went I and mean, put too many things at last, but uh, okay, I, I cannot resist to, to show the excitement that we have in this field. Thanks a lot, Gina, for the very nice, clear, and comprehensive presentation. So uh, I think that we can open the Q and A section. Session. So please uh, feel free to ask question, and we will uh, then try to answer to them. There is an, uh, a hand raised. Uh, if you want, I can. Uh, ah. Antonio Maziera, if, if you want, I can uh, allow him to talk. Sure, sure, please. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Gino. It was a very nice uh, colloquium. Uh, I was wondering the following, uh, as you know, the other possible uh, hint for the presence of new physics, uh, uh, we have uh, um, in uh, low energy physics uh, comes from the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. Uh, so I was wondering, since you have uh, this uh, uh, new physics uh, at the TV scale, it is related only to anomalies uh, in third generation, as you pointed out. Uh, yet, uh, uh, you know, uh, one can yes, like... wonder uh, if this new physics uh, could produce also, say, uh, effects not related to flavor physics, but other... Uh, no, it, uh, Antonio, yes. yeah. I, I, I completely understand that the point did actually is, is a question that uh, I receive often my, myself, I ask myself, so which could be the impact I, on, on G-2? And should I, I have one, one slide prepared on this. Yeah. And so I think clearly G-2, First of all, I, I would say it could really open a different story, especially if the charged current anomalies will go away. Okay. So, I mean, all the, my, my story that I, I made, I mean, trying to, co to connect the B2S and B2Char really point to this uh, non specific flavor structure, which is connected to the anomalies, to, to the, to the Yukawa coupling. Sorry. If the, the charged economy will go away, I mean, one can still try to combine BS mu mu and the, the G minus two anomaly. Okay, this is actually very natural because actually both of them involve muons. So certainly <clears throat> muons are player a, 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 both in the in the B-physics case and the case of the of the G minus two. So let me first discuss this. So suppose that the, the B2 charm anomaly goes away and I just want to, to combine these two. So can we do that? Well, in this case, I think clearly the best way to would be to, to give a special role to muons. Okay maybe also to Taos. And then I think the best way to describe this is via some Z prime, like a, a L mu minus L tau interaction, something that really interacts with mu and tau, but not, uh, or at least in a trivial way with the, with, the, with the course. This is certainly possible, and there are a lot of uh, papers on, on this recently. 
I would say that the connection between the two is less straightforward than the one that I discussed in the case of uh, B2S and B2S, simply because, uh, see, G-2 is about a bit more tricky because we really don't know the structure of the operator because uh, this is certainly generated at, at the one loop level. Well, in this case, you can generate it at three levels. <clears throat> Most important, uh, if this is the case, you really lose somehow the possible connection to the Yukawa coupling, okay? So it's, it's a different thing. It's something that did it's something special. It's a kind of a, a most likely connected to a new U1 symmetry. And also, what is a bit puzzling, in my opinion, is that you really have to give a special role to the lepton flavor, to the exact lepton flavor conservation, to avoid the bounce from E3 gamma. You can see here if I put mu and E, then this operator would contribute to mu3 gamma, and we don't see anything yeah. mu3 gamma. So if G minus two is really there, and okay, it's absolutely possible, this is a four sigma deviation, then I think uh, quark and lepton seems to be a bit different. That is really, in the case of lepton, we really have a kind of exact symmetries, or at least breaking at much higher scale with respect to, 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 to quark. And it doesn't seem to be related to the Yukawa coupling, which is absolutely a possibility. Uh, but indeed, it's a bit of a different story. I, I think putting all together is challenging. I think there's been some attempt recently, but I think then it's really, you cannot do it with simple, nice gauge models, okay? Then you really have to introduce more complicated structure and uh, like for instance, with, with scalar laptop work, you have a lot of parameters to, 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 to fit. I think uh, the the... the Aesthetic of the model, I think I would say, is a bit lost. This is why I think one of the three anomalies, in my opinion, should go away. It's my my guess. I don't. I mean, it could be that I'm wrong. Or if you want, if there is, or or maybe more ingredients should enter into the game. I mean, maybe there is indeed this connection between B2S and B2Char, but then in addition, something else, some new field which also will connect to the to the will contribute to G minus two. So it could be, maybe there is, the, 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 there is a, the, maybe you're just opening a Pandora box and things are, are, are uh, really interesting at the TV scale. The, the only thing I, I, I want to say is that uh, I mean, B2S and B2Champ really seems to fit nicely together with an old problem, which was uh, the Yukawa puzzle. G minus two appear a bit more like a surprise, um, yeah, so I think we have to, to, to wait. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another question is from uh, Kekia, I think Paolo. Can I allow him? Sure, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you for the nice uh, um, seminar. Can you go back? I, I wonder in concerning this uh, five sigma evaluation of the of the yeah. effect. Can you put back the slide where you have this uh, this uh, experimental results? Yes, here. Yeah. Maybe the previous one. Uh, the one yeah. with the values with the experiment, the single experiment. Yeah. Okay. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, what could be the correlate, okay, something that correlates the measurement, I mean, some uh, theoretical computation or something like that, that makes uh, uh, the deviation uh, up to five uh, sigma if you don't consider that uh, the correlation can lower down the, the, the significance. Oh, okay, it's a, it's a very good point. So, you see, it is not each measurement alone is not particularly significant. Actually, the, the highest significant is only uh, three sigma, okay? On the other hand, we can combine all this measurement under a very general hypothesis. The general hypothesis is that new physics is generated by a contact interaction of the type B2S mu mu. And this is just the, the hypothesis saying that new physics is heavy. Okay, if new physics is heavy, then you really can describe it only by these effective operators. There is nothing else, so you cannot uh, change each bin of the measurement. So you should change them in a correlated way because you, you don't assume that there are new light particles. 
So you assume that there is only a new local interaction, like a new Fermi type interaction. So this gives a correlation, a way to combine the different measurements. That's why in this case, we reach the five sigma. Okay, so it's just the hypothesis of having heavy new physics, that is a contact interaction. It, was it clear? Yes, thank you. So, and, and to be maybe, maybe more precise, you see that the type of content interaction we are considering are, are, are these two, and this, with these two, we really get the, the, the five sigma. If we allow the most general type of content interaction, we get the 4.3 sigma, because simply there, there's a kind of look, look, uh, look elsewhere effect, because there are different types of like interaction, but even considering them all, still the significance is, is uh, quite high. Okay, thank you. Uh, Massimo Passera raised uh, the hand. Please, please, Massimo. You made a mistake, Gino. I'm sorry. Sorry? Ah, okay. You made a mistake. Sorry. Sorry, Gino. Thank you for the nice talk. Very nice. Welcome. So if, uh, if there are no other questions, I would have a very general question to Gino, and uh, uh, so which is maybe relevant for our young students, no? So um, what is your impression? This field of research, uh, which of course includes both experimental, uh, the experimental frontier as well as the theoretical frontier mm -hmm. to interpret possible uh, discrepant data that we, which will be hope, hopefully reinforced by current experimental results. Uh, which are, which is your your view? I mean, uh, it's it's a field that could uh, uh, achieve uh, some relevant progress in the next few years, in the next few decades. Uh, uh, which is your timeline that you? Oh, I, 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 yeah, there's a thanks for the question. I think what is really exciting is that uh, in the next few years, we should really all, all these uh, will become much more clear because of, of new data. So, while it will be very difficult, almost I would say impossible to go to, to high energies, on the other hand, on the improvement, this low energy measurement, uh, uh, really, the, we expect a kind of breakthrough because uh, we expect uh, 10 times more data pretty soon also for, from different experiments which will be even opening up new new channel which so far we we, we don't observe so in particular the bell experiment in in japan which just started so i think uh, i really i think in, in a short time i think this issue will be clarified so if these anomalies are there and i think uh, really b2slL the significance it's high we should uh, clearly see that in different experiment in different observable in a, in a relatively short time, this question of, uh, of three to four years. And then uh, still, there will be a long program because we can add more observable, look at more suppressed channel, and we can learn much more. Did I, when, when I when I try in my qualitative uh, thing here, you see, I, I try to sketch. You see, there are a lot of different, uh, the, the different operators all connected. And there are, for instance, like a process like B2S tau mu is something that we should see uh, and uh, and it's a, it's a, um, really the interplay of the different observable what makes this uh, field interesting, okay? And, and then I think we really expect an interplay of, of measurement with that will uh, will uh, will be able to 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 make significant progress, short in, in a short time scale. I see, I see. Thanks, thanks a lot. Probably I stop sharing. Okay, so Sarah, do you see other 
raise hand? No, or no, no. no. There is no one. Okay. So if there are no other questions, it's time to thanks. Uh, again, Gino, for the very nice and uh, comprehensive talk. And uh, we, we, we all hope that at some point we'll be able to, to meet in person and to, to make this discussion even more lively and, uh, and uh, fruitful. And uh, thanks again, Gino, and see you as soon as possible. <laughs> thanks to you. It was, it was really a pleasure to, to join. Sorry if I've, maybe I put too many things, but I, I hope, no, I hope no, at least no, to no. give you a, a glimpse of the... I think it's really an interesting, interesting field. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs>